Yeah, hundred percent. All right. So, um, good morning, everybody. My name is Dr. Susco. Um, this lecture is called "Debating the Case," and this lecture is a excerpt of a very famous lecture in debate that you can actually go on YouTube and look at it. So this is a um, structure that I'm gonna be giving you today on how to extend a case argument that was given to me um, when I was in camp and was given to literally any top debater that won the TOC or won the NDT has had some form of this lecture given to them. This lecture was originally given by um, this man, Ross Smith. Uh, if you have ever, I'm sure we're all aware of the RKS Wake Forest Debate Camp. It was named after that coach, Ross Smith. I had the um, pleasure of him being my lab leader when I was 16 years old. Um, and I am not gonna do the mm K, but um, you would get that reference if you watch the video. So feel free to watch it. It's a great video. Um, it's about 23 minutes long on this. So I'm gonna give you that structure um, and then we can talk about some specific instances that you've all been in. This is primarily extending case arguments in a policy v. policy debate. However, you'll find that the structure that we're gonna be talking about is so universal that it can be case debating when you know, you're know you a 1N and your 2N makes you take the advantage, for example. So this is also a structure that is primarily gonna be about the neg block, but is a structure that if you apply this to the 1AR, if you apply this to the 2AR, um, it will pay in dividends. So for example, this lecture, um, one of Ross's best debaters, um, a debater named Seth Gannon, who won the national debate tournament, he was a coach of mine, and he applied the same kind of structure to when he would uh, give me 1ARs and when he would give me advice on how to give a 1AR. So uh, we're gonna get into that specific structure um, and there are gonna be a few tips that go along with that, okay? So as a recap, you know, this is just kind of the basics. So in any given 1NC, um, typically you'll have um, some evidence being read, right? So in a 1NC that's not 9-11 off, right? You'll have somewhere along the lines of um, three to five cards, right? So I've always been told that you should number your uh, 1NCs, which is always a good idea to create a structure to it. So we have four cards in this example. And um, Luke, why if you're able to see that on the board? Yeah, okay, awesome. So basic structure, right? Um, for this purpose, we don't care if it's a straight turn, if it's an impact turn, if it's case defense, that's completely fine. So two ACs, We'll do all sorts of things. There's a trend now to do overviews. We'll ignore that. But a 2AC will try and answer things as quickly as possible, right? So some 2ACs, they might group one and group two, right? So they'll just group these on the flow and then they'll have their answers. They might on number three, just have an analytical argument. And then on number four, they might have they might have to read two cards on a debate, right? So this is pretty normal in any given debate, right? In a two AC, and um, raise your hand if you're a two A here, okay? So all of you two As are guilty of this of just literally just breezing through the two AC to get through as much off case arguments as possible. Um, it's pretty typical, right? You're just trying to make the responses and then move on to the positions that you're worried about, right? That is the trend for contemporary high school debate. Um, it's something that all two A's do. And this lecture is about punishing them with this structure. So I'm gonna be putting the block here instead of a one in R or a two NC. And the reason for that is this structure can be applied for either, either situation, okay? Um, some of you might 
be doing DA and then case in the 2NC and you give your one and R um, topicality, it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't matter, right? So here is gonna be our structure for what we're gonna be doing. What do we think the first thing to do in a case debate is? What do, you, what do we think the first thing in a structure of extending a case argument is? Anybody wanna wager a guess? Let me get the slack off. <clears throat> extending a case argument. <clears throat> yeah. So when you're extending the case, similar to a 2AC, 1AR, 2AR, right? In a 2AC, you'll have somewhere along the lines of like five, seven arguments, right? If all seven arguments make it into the 2AR, that's typically bad, right? Because you don't have the same level of analysis. You, at some point, the 1AR is supposed to pick the best winning arguments of those. Maybe it's the impact defense strategy and maybe it's the link turn. A lot of times it's just because the block drops arguments. In case debating, we do the same thing. So we read four or five, six, seven pieces of evidence and it's our job in the neg block to pinpoint a specific argument and go into detail about that. So for this uh, specific example, we're gonna try and extend argument number three, all right? So when you're debating the case, the first thing you do is you extend the argument. So um, you extend number three. Okay, so you just extend it to allow for people to know where you are in the flow, right? That's why it's, the numbering's good. So you can just go right over here and then go there. We can always just drop arguments on the case because sometimes arguments are a time suck. Sometimes they have the goods on the link and the impact level, but we want to destroy them on a uniqueness claim or depending on the strategy of what we want to do. You know, if you're going for a DA debate, maybe you want to be at the terminal impact defense level so that your disadvantage outweighs. Or if it's a critique, you want to be attacking at the link level to get to some of your best offense. So the first one, the first rule or part of the formula is to extend your argument. Now, this can be extend 1NC number three. You want to just have it by the claim that it is, right? You're not saying extend our Smith evidence um, because most times, as we all know, you will flow the argument first, then the author, right? Um, and coach of mine said, and I'm sure you've heard this um, multiple times, when you are writing tags, you should always front load your tags because in a given tag that might be a sentence or two sentences long, when you flow that, none of us flow the entire two sentences. We flow the first six words. So it's important for us to extend the argument. So what do we think the next logical step is to do after we extend the claim? Say where we're at. So we're on one NC number three. We're on one NC number three. Uh, if they were to attack the weakness, maybe defend that. Defend. So we're not going to do any defending yet. Yeah. Um, yes, name? Sorry, I'm curious. Do you think the most logical thing after extending the claim would be to shorten the warrant down? Shorten the warrant down. Okay. So let's, um, you're, you're very close. Okay. Let's put context to this, right? So you're a judge, you're a debater. The 1AC is red, the 1NC is red at very, very high speeds. So a lot of times, the um, judge themselves isn't going to know what the argument is at this point. So the main goal of the neg block is to have an over explanation advantage because the 1ER is in an explanation deficit. So you are getting to the getting to a very another way of, that I would explain it is explain your argument. So it's not shorten down the warrants. This is the time to explain the warrants. And a lot of times, say you have a judge that's flow centric, they don't want to read the evidence. This is where you can parse out and beat people when somebody says beat somebody on the line by lines, beat somebody on the flow. 
you can say, listen, our evidence has these two, three warrants. Here's what our argument is. So and it allows you to provide context, to provide explanation to your argument that typically a judge would do at the end of the round reading the evidence itself. So um, where what's the context of it? Does it provide some empirical analysis? Does it have a, is it timely? So does it post date what happened in Ukraine? Does it post date what happened with the strategic concept? You know, making these delineations that would allow for your evidence to be stronger than your opponents. So then the third, and this is kind of where people stop. People typically in case debating stop here, okay? Um, all of us are guilty of this. This is like, we do these two things um, and then we just stop the debate itself, okay? What do we think the, the third part of this extending the case formula is? The third part. Offense. Offense? More, all right, uh, first name? John. Okay, um, and what do you mean by offense? I mean, like uh, providing kind of more support behind the argument, uh, making it bigger, uh, making it take, take up more space or more putting argument. So we're very close in terms of um, both of your points for this. I like to explain this through a sports lens, um, which is you explain how good is your argument. So this is where you talk up your evidence. Your evidence is more qualified. Maybe your evidence has a better empirical backing. Maybe your evidence has more context or is in a different context than the affirmative. So for example, um, a lot of times with affirmatives this year, their evidence, if it's um, you know from 2020 or 2021, why is that evidence um, have some holes in it? Why does that evidence have some holes in it? Before Russia and Ukraine. Yeah, before Russia and Ukraine, right? So you can apply a big ge um, geopolitical event that happened, and that may have shifted some things in a, in a direction. For, so for example, some solvency advocate evidence that might say NATO needs to do X for its cybersecurity, NATO needs to do Y for its AI. That doesn't assume all of the actions that the US and NATO have taken since the Ukraine conflict happened, since the strategic concept happened. So explaining how good your evidence is, it might be more qualified, it might be from a person that's um, a former NATO commander, it might be from a, form, uh, a professor that has a PhD in that field. So this is where you set your evidence apart of why your evidence is more qualified than your opponent, okay? So notice that we have gone into three parts of the case extension, but we haven't done, we haven't responded to their argument yet, right? The 2AC made a response to our 1 and C3, and we haven't um, said why that answer, what a uh, specific response to their answer. Doesn't that seem a little weird? Now, the reason that we do, we, we do this is you want to posit your offense first. You want to be in an explanation advantage over your opponent because a lot of times, number four is line by line. A lot of times we get into a, a an argument where they say X, here's my response. They say Y, here's my response. For the judge, remember, in a debate, a judge flows the one AC, flows the one NC. We don't know, you know, how much of the F they're actually um, reading. Sometimes there's judges that read a ton. Sometimes there's judges that are just on the flow. So whereas the debaters in the round, they have all the context in the world because the neg knows their arguments, the AF knows their arguments, and you're a lot more focused in on. But from the judge, they don't have that context. So this structure, one, two, three, provides context of what is happening in the debate. 
And then this argument right here, number four, doing line by line, oftentimes you've already answered it above. So it's so obvious that the two AC response doesn't apply. You don't even need to directly say the line by line, but that's a structure of my offense first. You know, it's the same concept of why when we're neg, we do our off case first, then we go to the case. It's getting your argument out there for an explanation of what is being there. Um, ben, you had a question. Uh, why you do one by one after the uh, explain why your argument is good? So you have to provide context of what your argument is. Because okay. oftentimes when you're extending an argument, it's built in to answer something that the 2AC said. So it becomes very obvious to you and to the judge on why your line by line argument makes sense. So you always have to think about it from when you're explaining an argument, how much background knowledge does my judge have on this? And at this camp, you know, maybe you have a lab leader that's judging you um, and they may know a lot about the Article 5 app, about the, the cyber app, about the AI app. But when we get into the season, unless they went to the DDI camp, unless they went to a camp where, um, uh, where they're a team that reads the same app as you, they don't have that context. So you need to provide that context to give the judge understanding of where it is. Because normally if you don't do this, which you know nobody does, right? Here's what a judge will do at the end of the debate is if they have to decide between an advantage and a disadvantage, they're just reading the cards and they're coming up with their own conclusions of those. This strategy basically guides their mind to be thinking about the advantage to be thinking about the case and not even have to look at that evidence because you are doing more explanation than the affirmative would ever be doing. Okay. So we have one last tip, one last part of this formula. All right. And so this is something that every judge does that if we do in the one and R, we tie the judge's hands very early on. Right. So the last part of it, number five, is to impact your argument. Impact your argument. Um, how many of you watch um, a like professional sport? It could also be an esport. How many of you watch the um, a game where there's like a commentator. So for me, for example, I'm big into basketball. I watch NBA and TNT just because I love Charles Barkley and Shaq just going at it. But I'll watch some NBA games and they'll, they'll do the, the, we've heard of like play-by-play -play announcers, right? I always like to think of number five of impacting your argument of saying why you've won this argument and what does it mean for the debate? So this is where you do risk assessment. This is where you say, this advantage is a toast, this advantage is done. This is um, this link argument means that we're winning offense for a straight turn and the advantage is now a disadvantage um, to the affirmative. This is where you're assessing how much of the case are they actually getting? How much of the case that they're actually getting? So. The judge does this every single debate. They say, all right, in the two and R, you extended three arguments. What is the probability of those three arguments? How strong are those three arguments? And then the judge will weigh that case debate versus the advantage itself. You doing all of these things ties the judge's hand. And if the affirmative doesn't respond to these components, right? It's the equivalent of a AF dropping a util card, an AF dropping a your impact leads to extinction card. They are dropping a framing of how you look at the debate and that's where you can punish them. That's where you can punish them. Now notice, right, this formula, you extend your argument, you explain it, you explain how good that specific argument is. This can be applied to a two in our case argument. It can be applied to a two AR argument. It can be applied to the one AR. I would apply this to the one AR 
all the time. Of instead of going for five of the seven two AC arguments, I go for two, and I would do this extension, maybe read a card or two. Okay. It is much more beneficial to do a structure like this than how a lot of people do case debating, which is read three or four impact cards. They're all kind of the same and they don't get into the same level of nuance. They're kind of redundant and a ju judge doesn't look at them. This structure forces the judge to evaluate, weigh, and look at a piece of evidence and then move, move to another component. And the other thing you notice here too is, so this is relatively time consuming, but when you're in the neg block, you're not extending every argument. So we had in our example, our argument number one, argument number two, argument number three, and argument number four. We have only said in number three, and that's perfectly fine to do, where you pick your moments, you pick your spots in the neg block, and then you extend your argument from there. So, like I said, the structure is relatively easy to understand. Um, what I'm going to hit uh, stop record, but we are going to move to the question part of this.